All right. You guys want to have a seat? Corey? Um, well, we're going to have Corey talk about the youth again, uh, just because there's some kids in here, and we want them to hear what's going on. I'm gonna... Can everybody hear me? Yeah? All right. Good morning. Come on, we can do it louder than that. Good morning. Good morning. All right. All right. So the kids that were in the, the youth group in the morning, did you like it? Yes. Louder, man. I talked about this in the youth group. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Trying to make me look bad. Good thing you guys said yes because I didn't have anything if you guys said no. Okay. <laughs> All right. So today we opened up with a game called the Big Squeezy. Three kids came up, and we were time squeezing all the toothpaste out of the toothpaste tubes. Easy, right? But the hard part was they were timed five minutes to put the toothpaste back into the tubes. Yes, it was messy. Kids, God's word tells us over and over again that our words have incredible power. We can use them to bring blessings and life or curses and death. What a responsibility for you guys. If we are quick to blurt whatever out of our mouth, kids, just remember we can't put it back into the tube. James 3, 5, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a f small fire. We will be going over how we speak to people and how God wants us to communicate with people pretty much the whole month of March and probably a couple weeks into April. Because, kids, we love getting told that we we're doing a good job or that we're nice, right? I didn't hear no kids say anything. Yeah. yeah, okay. All right. So if we like getting told that we're nice or getting told that we're doing a good job with something, don't other people want to hear it too? Yeah? Okay. I'm excited for how strong we become and the amazing things God has in store for us. And I can't wait to see all the youth and my group. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple announcements today. Um, this whole Easter season, it would be a nice reminder to have in your house. And you could even make one and maybe if you have an older family member or you know somebody in a nursing home, it'd be nice to make something. You could even make a smaller one for them to have out. Okay. And then also, um, we had Bible... that, you know, if you're driving, that they'll have seats for you. Um, kids Fellowship is tonight at 5 o'clock, and Sandy's going to come and talk to the kids. And um, if any, huh? Oh, tonight it'll be in the church instead of in Heritage House. If any of the adults would like to come and speak, Sandy's going to talk to them about card ministry tonight and bring some stuff and work with them. But if there's anything that any of you guys would like to do, it's... 
um, the first and the third Sunday of the month. Just let Ruth know, or you can talk to me. Um, and if there's anything you guys would like to help with as far as kids, just let us know. Um, even crafts. Connie brought some crafts today and dropped them off so that we can use towards the Easter season. And any anything that anybody wants to contribute, we really appreciate it. Um, and that should be it for today. Yes. That was probably more for me than anyone else, just to say. But all right. <laughs> okay. So, kids, church. If you are sixth grade and below, you can head back to church. Kids, church. Um, we're going to try something since we now have a youth program seventh and above. You guys get to be with us. Cool, right? Um. Yeah. So exciting. I don't know how many of the kids there are. If you're, if you're a teen, if you're in the youth and there's only like two of you in here and you really want to go back, I think today would be okay. Yeah, I want to go back. If you want to head back, because there's not that many kids today, so if you're feeling it, go ahead and head back. The whole point was, Corey was called to the youth and there was like 20-some kids back there in kids' church and Lord have mercy. Lord knows that's a lot of kids in one spot. So we have two in the house, and it's a, sometimes it's a train wreck. So um, I'm, a, I'm hoping my voice holds up. I've been praying all morning that it holds up. We will see. If not, you're going to see the notes get passed to Corey, and he's going to come up and preach, right? <laughs> His eyes just got about 10 times bigger than what they were. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So Jennifer mentioned all the the resurrection garden. I probably won't help with it, but I'll enjoy it if she does it. Um, Yeah, and when you're done, send pictures to the church so we can see what you did, because that'd be cool. Um, Also, if you're new here, fill out a welcome card. Tithe box is in the back. Uh, You can also go on Tithely. Um, uh, There's tons of prayer requests on uh, Sandy's bulletin as well. Make sure that you are praying for these people. Um, As a church family, we pray. Don't forget that every Tuesday we are praying for the lost and for our community, for our nation, for our world. Um, What else is there? Oh, the Revelations study. We are going to probably start that in April. So if you need a book, um, give a... If you would like the church to order it for you, maybe you don't know how to work Amazon or whatever, uh, get with Connie and I and Jennifer. Connie and I can take your money because she's the treasurer, and Jenny can order it for, for you, okay? I just, I just volunteered you without even asking you, Connie, but, <laughs> but it's... We'll let you know. <laughs> To be determined. There you go. Um, it's going to go verse by verse. It's a really good study. It's called 40 Days Through Revelation. So this will be a good time for us to come together. And you'll get to see me and Jenny kind of bicker back and forth about different things, maybe. I don't know. It'd be interesting. We've never led a study together. So it could be fun. I don't know. You might get in some enjoyment out of it. But let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for each person that's here. Father, we pray for the ones that can't be here with us today, Lord, that you would watch over them, that you would keep them safe. Uh, Father, we pray for the ones that are online watching today, too, that you would just send blessing up over their household. I pray that your presence would just overflow our hearts today, Lord, that our hearts would be open, our minds would be open. Father, you have, uh, you've given me these words, Lord. I just pray that um, I speak them boldly with truth. We pray for every pastor and every church out there that the congregation would be receiving of the word, Lord, and that uh, the pastors would be speaking in truth boldly, Lord, and just exactly what you would have them preach to their congregations. Father, we thank you um, for everything that you've given us this week, this time that we get to spend together. 
We thank you for those that uh, have given to you today, Lord, and I pray that just like you say in Malachi, Lord, that uh, if we give, Lord, that you will open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out more blessings than we can stand. Father, I pray that on every single person here. And I pray this in Jesus' name, and you get all the glory and all the praise. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. So last week, we started our sermon series on who is Jesus. All right, and last week, um, and this is, this is something as we move towards Easter, I think it's a good foundation, a good reminder for everyone. Remember, the question was and has been debated for more than 2,000, 2000 years. Who is Jesus? As forever learners, it is good for us to go back to the basics, to get back to the foundations, right? I don't care where you are in your walk. We all need to be reminded. It's all good to have. It's it's good for us to be reminded. It helps us grow and, and learn and stay on fire to know what we believe and why we believe it. Last week, we looked at Jesus as our Savior, that no matter what your past looks like, or what your life looks like right now, Jesus says, come as you are, and there is a seat at the table for you. We listened to a story last week called Jacob's story of him, of Jesus being this man's savior. And I guarantee if you ask anyone in this room, we're all going to say, and tell, we can tell you our story of Jesus being our savior. Every single one of us has a story. So I don't care what your past looks like. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what it looks like right now. The gift of salvation is for all. Christ died on the cross for every single person. When you do accept Jesus in your heart, he starts to change you. He starts to change you from the inside out, making you more and more like Christ. If you have your Bibles today, Matthew uh, chapter 11, verse 28 through 30 is going to be our main scripture focus. I heard some Bibles flipping already, so you guys are on it. It says uh, in Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30, Come to me, all you who are, weary, who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gem- gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my sake, for my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. What he's saying is, that that sin that's got a hold on you, that anxiety, addiction, whatever it may be that has a hold on you, that's got a grip on you and doesn't seem to let go, that he can take it all away. That he can change everything. All the worry, the anxiety, addiction, you name it. There's tons of things that you could throw in there. Whatever, make it personal. He can take all of it away. If you just come to him, all that can be gone. And what he replaces it with is so much greater. He replaces it with love, peace, joy, hope, and a deeper walk, a deeper relationship with God. (coughs) Jesus tells us to come to him. He says, come to me a mess. I don't care what it looks like. If you just come to me, you can be the biggest mess in the world. And he says, I'll clean you up. I can change everything in your life. Just like the analogy I used last week. We don't get in the shower already clean, right? We get in the shower to get cleaned up. Well, Jesus says, you just come to me however you are. Let me in and I can clean you up. And if you let him in, I promise you, he can change your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. That's some good news, ain't it? That when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, at that moment, you are given a new life, a new chance. You are born again. When we accept Jesus, we are forgiven. The past is washed white by the blood of Jesus. We are free from sin, given this new life in Christ, So after salvation, what are we supposed to do? Remember, salvation is just the starting line. As we continue our relationship with Jesus, grow and build on it, and I pray that's what you do, is 
that you don't just come to Jesus and you say, God, I want you in my life, and that's all you do with it because you ain't going to get nowhere with it. It's a two-part, right? It's a relationship with God. Through this sermon series, you're going to hear me talk a lot about relationship. Relationships with God. That's what it's all about. As you grow and build on it, get to know him, I promise you he will change you. He will make you more like him, more Christ-like each and every day. That sin that had a grip on you, he can take that away. Anxiety, if you have anxiety, he can take that away. Worry, he can take that away. Addiction, he can take that away. I know a lot of people jump to addiction as, you know, it could be drugs, it could be cigarettes, it could be alcohol. It could be shopping, right? Some people have food addiction. It could be a number of things. If you're prideful, adultery, it can all go away. Confess it to him. Leave it at the cross and do not pick it up. That's our part, to come to God in a humble way and say, Jesus, I want to be closer to you. I want a deeper relationship with you. And you humble yourself and you say, this, this is keeping me from having this deeper walk with you. And you lay it at the cross. You say, I don't want, I don't want this to have a hold on my life. And you leave it there. But that's the key. We got to leave it there. So many times in life that we, when, we, when we give it to them, we come back and we say, oh, I like this baggage. I'm going to pick it back up. In Romans chapter 6, verse 18, you have been set free from sin and have, be, have, and have become slaves to righteousness. If you truly give it to God and leave it at the cross, you are free from its grip. It'll have no power over you. We have been given a new life in Christ. We cannot serve two masters. Here's the thing, guys. You can't serve two. We choose either God or the world. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. Now, it's not just money, though, is it? Like I said, it could be pride. It could be those cigarettes. It could be alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be shopping. It could be anything that is over top of you that is keeping you from having a deeper walk with God. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that we'll never sin again? No, because we will. We're fallen. We're broken. We live in a broken world. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm sorry, this cough drop is... I'm going to get rid of it. There you go. What we have to remember, guys, is that we're human. We live in a fallen, broken world. And what our life's goal is, is to be more Christ-like. We have to remember that while we are here on this earth, this short bit of time, that this is training. That God is training you up to be holy. He is training you up to spend eternity with him. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the, the creator of the universe. He's training you up to spend eternity with him. What we have to do is we have to repent when we do mess up and say, and it has to, we have to mean it from the heart. All this has to be a heart response. You have to truly want it in your heart. When you lay whatever has a grip on you at the cross and you say, God, I don't want this anymore. What I want is a deeper relationship with you. It's got to be from the heart. You know, we're going we're gonna to get times when God says, when we get these convictions. And I'm sure we've all felt convictions. What God's saying is, hey, you don't need that. You can be better. You can do better. You know why he knows you can do better? Because the moment you ask Jesus into your heart, he dwells within you. He lives within you. He lives in your heart. 
The power that rose Jesus from the grave is coursing through your veins. He knows you can do better because he is with you. Remember that when you feel these convictions and you feel, you're going to feel kind of cruddy because you're going to be like, man, why did I think I wanted to do that? Why did I fall back into that sin? Why do I feel so bad? Because he's convicting you because he loves you. Because he wants you to be close to him. And when we sin, when we fall back into those sins, we put a barrier between us and God. And he doesn't want that barrier. Convictions, I think, are amazing. It lets you know that you're loved. Yeah, how many... After my grandparents died, I had a hard time figuring out, you know, who, who was going to love me, right? Because my grandparents were everything to me. Me and Jenny hadn't gotten together yet, mainly when my grandma died. She was like my rock. Like, I went to her for everything, talked to her about everything. If I was sad, if I was upset, mad, it didn't matter. She was the person I went to. But, you know, when, when I found Jesus, that all changed because then I started going to him. And I started tr truly seeing what love is. Just like my grandma used to do, she would give me advice and say, hey, this ain't right for your life. You're messing it up right now. Go get a switch, right? Because that's what grandmas do. They tell you, go get the switch. Better not bring back a little skinny one either. You better bring something with some beef into it, right? I can get the little snap like a whip. Just like that, God wants you he wants the best out of your life. He wants you to have an abundant life. He wants you to be useful. He wants you to be a witness. So remember, when these convictions come, it's not to make you feel bad. He just wants you to know that he's there for you, that he loves you, that he's going to walk through this with you, and that you can do better because he dwells within you. He's doing all this so he can have a relationship with you and me. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. This is good and pleasing, God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Like I said during the sermon series, we're going to go through a lot about relationships with Jesus because God desires a relationship with each one of us. He wants us to have an abundant life. If we look at the beginning, at the beginning of time, God said, it was not good for us to be alone. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, If I rebuild what, what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. What it's saying is uh, we can't be saved by the law alone, by works, by just being a good person, only through a relationship with Jesus Christ can we be saved. God gave us relationships. Much of what we're to gain, learn, and experience from healthy relationships is a reflection of the kind of connection God wants to have with each one of us. In his human form, Jesus showed how he desired a close relationship, reflection, or need for that close relationship with the Creator. We can see time after time how God and Jesus, how Jesus went off alone and spent time with God, away from the crowds, away from the disciples. We are created in God's image. We are made to have close relationship with the Father. It's a basic desire of our life. It is evident that relationships are a key factor in God's plan of salvation. Without relationships, God's plan is lost. We can see how Jesus went off. He had alone time with the Father to have a relationship with him. He modeled this for us. His whole life was a model. And Matthew chapter 14, verse 23 shows us, after he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. In Mark chapter 6, verse 46 through 47, after leaving them, he went up to the mountainside to pray. 
Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on the land. And again, in John 6, 15, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king, make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Time after time, we see Jesus get alone with God over and over again for his personal relationship with the Father. So I'm going to ask you like I asked you last week. What does your relationship with God look like? How does that look? This is a time that you have to really, truly be honest with yourself. Don't sugarcoat it. No one else has to know. It's just between you and God. What does your relationship look like with Jesus? Truly be honest. Because if I come and ask you, right, most of you, most people sugarcoat it. Oh, it's great. It's wonderful. I pray all the time. I read all the time. Truly be honest with yourself. What does your relationship look like? Ask God to help and reveal what it needs to look like. In Psalms chapter 139, verse 23 through 24, Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxieties, thoughts. See if there are any offensive way in me and lead me into the way of everlasting. So who is Jesus? We know from last week that Jesus is our Savior, but he is also our sanctifier. Remember, salvation is just the start. He says, come to me, a mess, come to me all messed up. Whatever you have going on, I don't care. Come to me. But he's not going to leave you that way. He doesn't want you to stay in that area. So we know that he's a savior. We know he's a sanctifier now. Why is it Jesus is not happy or content just leaving us the way we are? How does he invite us to continue becoming more and more like him? And what does it look like? Jesus is our sanctifier. We are made in his image and growing in the likeness of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. This is both a moment and a process that is a lifetime. You're not just going to wake up one day after salvation and everything's going to be perfect. It's a lifetime. That's why we are called forever learners. Because it's a lifetime of learning and being Christ-like. See, we do so out of love and our desire to live for him through a relationship with Jesus. So this is what, I'm going to read, this is straight out of the manual. We believe that sanctification is the work of God, which transforms believers into the likeness of Christ. It is wrought by God's grace through the Holy Spirit and in initial sanctification or regeneration, simultaneously with justification. Entire sanctification and the continued perfecting work of the Holy Spirit. We believe that entire sanctification is that act of God subsequent to regeneration by which believers are made free from original sin or depravity and brought into a state of entire development to God and the holy obedience of love made perfect. <clears throat> it is wrought by the baptism with the unfilling of the Holy Spirit and comprehends in one experience the cleansing of the heart from sin. The abiding and dwelling presence of the Holy Spirit empowering the believer for life and service. Entire sanctification is provided by the blood of Jesus. It's wrought instantaneously by grace through faith, preceded by entire consecration, and to the work and state of grace, the Holy Spirit bears witness. This is also known as Christian perfection, perfect love, heart unity, and Christian holiness. So what, how, did, how is Jesus our sanctifier? So if you, if you look at my story, I got saved, I got called, well, I got called first and I got saved. But I remember signing up for everything. God told me to go to school, so I signed up for that. Told me to go into ministry, so I talked to my pastor. I got everything in order. 
I was getting ready to start school, and I was sitting there reading my Bible one night, and Satan come and knock, and he said, you ain't going to do this. And I started believing that I wasn't going to do it. And all this conflict started happening between me and God. All this wrestling started happening. See, what, what was happening is, was on our heart, we have a throne. And I was sitting on that throne. Up until that point, I was making decisions. What I wanted, what I wanted to get rid of, what I wanted to keep, what I wanted to do. And I was letting God, eh, we can do it every once in a while. But see, what happens is, is God said, he gave me a scripture at night in Exodus 4, 10 through 12, and it's where Moses is arguing with God, and he's saying, God, I can't do this. I can't, I can't go talk to Pharaoh about freeing your people. I'm not good at speaking. I'm paraphrasing, of course, if you didn't know. I can't speak good. I'm not eloquent. He says, Who's make, who makes human beings, gives them blind, make, gives them, or makes them blind or gives them sight? Who helps them to hear or be deaf? Who gives them the mouth to speak? It's I, the Lord, so go and I will give you every word. I will tell you exactly what to do. And at that point, I was like, all right, Jesus. And I kicked myself off that throne. I said, whatever you want for my life, whatever it might be, wherever you want me to go, wherever you want me to do, whatever it looks like, you're in control. You're on the throne of my heart. Whatever you tell me to get rid of in my life, I will get rid of. Whatever you tell me to do, I'll do. So how is Jesus our sanctifier? Sanctification is all that God does in us. And it is done by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. You were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit. Then initial sanctification accompanies justification and the new birth. So this is the point of salvation. You've been, free, you've been free from sin. You're forgiven. Tire sanctification is another moment in the process, a second stage in the work. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 through 24. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Here's that throne again. A lot of people just sit at salvation. They sit at the starting line. Because you know what happens? God says, hey, I want you to give this up because this is keeping us from having a full and abundant relationship with each other. This has got a hold on you, and this is your master too, and you can't serve too. For a lot of us, it could be Maybe cigarettes and alcohol is an idol to you. You're sitting there saying, I have to have it. Maybe it's porn. Maybe it's, maybe it's shopping. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's, it, name it, pride. The point is, guys, is in your heart, it has to be a heart response. Who sits on the throne of your heart? Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 says, You brought of vipers... How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Who sits on the throne of your heart? Show of hands, how many of you are stubborn? Honestly, it should be everyone. If we took a poll, and if, we, if I didn't see 100% in the world that everyone was stubborn, I'd say that's a lie. You know why I say that? Because we all wrestle with God, every single one of us. And if we're going to wrestle with the creator of the universe, the king of kings, the lord of lords, I bet you're stubborn, right? There, you just can't get around it.
Christ comes and dwells with you. The same power that rose him from the grave lives in you. Along with that, with you being stubborn, those addictions, those anxieties, the pridefulness, whatever it is, you could stop it just like that if you wanted to. Just like that. Because everyone's stubborn enough if they wanted to, I'm done with it and walk away. Leave it at the cross. And Jesus will take it away and he'll walk through it with you. When those temptations come, he'll be right there with you. Hey, I'm right here. You don't need it. The Holy Spirit's like a manager. Charles Stanley called him a manager for your life. That when things come up, he's sitting there in your ear like a Jiminy Cricket, right? Let me watch Pinocchio, right? That little cricket thing. Is that his name, Jiminy Cricket? I don't know. Right? And he like tells Pinocchio, like, hey, this is good, this is bad. The Holy Spirit dwells within you and he's telling you, hey, this is pleasing to God. This is good for your life. And when you start, when that temptation comes, he's saying, do you really want to do that? Because this is not pleasing to God. This is not holy. This is going to put a barrier between you and God. And we're all stubborn enough to be like, all right, I don't need it. I don't want it. See, what happens is, is everyone gets stuck at salvation because they get there and then God says, hey, I need you to give this up. And they're like, all this conflict starts happening. I don't want to give it up, God. And they start wrestling with him. I can still do this and be, be a Christian. I can still do this and, and be close to God. But God's saying, hey, I need you to get rid of this. I need you to lay that down. Let me change you. That throne there, if you're fighting with God, that means you're trying to sit on the throne. And you've kicked God completely off. Which is crazy to me. When I even think about my own life, it's crazy to me that when I do that, I'm sitting there thinking, God knows past, present, and future. He knows how it's going to play out. And I'm sitting here arguing with someone that knows how it's going to play out. Just think about this. If we just went along with what God told us, how much easier would life be? There would be no hard time. Like, we wouldn't be wrestling and having all of these crazy thoughts through our head because we'd be like, all right, God, you sit on the throne of my life. Whatever you tell me to do, I'll trust you. And when we go do it, even when it doesn't make sense, we know that God's got it. And if we just put him on the throne of our life, how much easier would it be during those times than us sitting there fighting with him? See, when you take yourself off that throne and you put yourself, in, or you, I'm sorry, you take yourself off the throne and you put him there, you're entirely sanctified. You have to remember that you're born again. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And he wants to change you from the inside. You came to him a mess and he wants to clean you up. He wants to make you in his image. But we have to get out of the way. When we do, when we get out of the way, he'll give us that peace, that joy, the love, the hope that we've never experienced. See, the work of the Holy Spirit, the work in our, he works in our lives. Christian character is described as the fruit of the Spirit. <coughs> Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. But the Spirit of the, I'm sorry, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Peter talks of the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 1-2, who has been chosen according to the forsake for, for no, knowledgeable of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to the obedience of Jesus Christ and sprinkling with his blood. And Paul declares, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Romans chapter 8, verse 13, for if I live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the Spirit 
you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Before Christ, you were alienated from the cross. After commitment to Christ, God working in my life, but I still sit on the throne in my heart, which means there is conflict. And we do not want to give up what Jesus is asking us to give up. I'm going to tell you right now, there's no excuse. And you can't, some of you are probably sitting there thinking, well, you don't know what it's like to have an addiction. I chewed, I chewed tobacco since I was 12. God took it away overnight. You know why? Because I'm stubborn. And when Jesus said, get rid of it, all right, God, I laid it down at the cross and I said, I ain't going to touch it again. Same with alcohol. He said, I want you to give that up because that's keeping me from having a relationship with you. Fine. You know why? Because I'm stubborn. You know why? Because I also fear God, which I think a lot of people in the world don't do anymore. As a Christian, from the point that I give my life to Christ, all I want to do is please him. But I also fear him into the point he's my heavenly father. How many of you obeyed your parents because you were afraid that you, what was going to be the outcome if you didn't? Right? I can tell you I did. My grandpa didn't use a switch, but his hand was like a dinosaur's claw. I mean, that thing was massive. And I knew that it was going to hurt, right? We, didn't, we, we stayed out of trouble because we feared the consequences. Because they were trying to raise us up to be good people. God's trying to raise you up to be Christ-like. He's given you new life, a fresh start. This world ain't going to give you a fresh start. It's not going to give you a new life. You know what they'll do? They'll, they'll, they'll give you all these things. They'll tell you how great these things are. And then once you get addicted to them or you think you have to have it, then they just keep abusing it. They keep shoving it in your face. God's saying, let me just take it away, and I'll walk through it with you. Entire sanctification, God envelops my heart and sits on the throne. But also, this change, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes place as a process, right? And we can see that before Christ, after commitment, and then sanctification. It is a process in your walk with Christ. And each one of us that are, are at a different stage in our walk. Maybe some of us haven't, we're just curious about what, who Christ is, and we're curious about this whole Christian life and being a follower of Jesus. So we're just, we're just here, and we're, we're trying to study here and there to see what it's all about. Maybe you give your life to Christ, but you haven't taken the next step, and there's things that you're, you're having conflict about, that you, he wants you to get rid of, but you're just like, ah, I still want it. And then there's others that have taken themselves off the throne. God envelops, your, envelops in your heart, and he sits on the throne. Everyone's going to be at a different stage. That's what's so great about church community is that we can all come together and we can help each other, grow and encourage each other. Hey, I've been there. Let me walk this with you. It's a process. Martin Luther is credited with having described the growth of Christian, Christian after conversion in this way. <coughs> a person is rapidly declining in health because of a disease. And the doctors do not know the cause. Then the doctors correctly diagnose the disease and prescribe the appropriate medication. He is not completely healed immediately upon starting to take the medication. But from that point on, he improves until he is completely well. In the same way, after we experience conversion, there is a decisive turn in our lives, after which the moment is in the direction of holiness rather than sin and death. The choice is ours, guys. 
When you give your life to Christ, I know for me, I just wanted to just please him. I wanted to know him better. I wanted to, to have this deep relationship with him. We have to let God in. God will do his part, but we have to do ours too. And when we, when we get out of our own way and we get off that throne and we put God there and we say, God, you can have this throne, he will change you from the inside out. If you thought you needed whatever it is that you're wrestling with God about, that he's telling you to get rid of, I promise you he'll take it away. Sooner or later, you'll find out you don't even want it anymore. Those temptations that you used to have, they'll even fade away. I knew that when I quit drinking, my, we used to like to go to Buffalo Wild Wings and watch the UFC fights. It was like our thing. And I knew, and I stopped going for like three months because I knew that I couldn't be around. My friends still drank. I knew I couldn't be around them. I wasn't, I wasn't in that capacity that I could handle it, that I knew, I knew I probably couldn't say no. So God convicted me. He said, do you really want to go to that knowing that you might be tempted? See, after a few months, though, I got to the point where God had just taken away. I no, longer, I no longer desired it. I no longer wanted it. All I wanted to do was please God. So I could go and I could hang out with them and you should see them waitresses when you order just water. When you're sitting at the bar watching a fight and you're like, what do you want? I'm like, water or coffee. They're like, man, we got to make a pot. Who drinks coffee during a fight? This guy. See, you get to this point in the process where those things that had a grip on you, they no longer matter. They no longer have a grip on you. The only thing that matters to you is Jesus and pleasing him and fearing him. Yes, God is love. Jesus is love, I'm telling you all day long, but we're also supposed to fear him. Read your Old Testament. He's a jealous God. He doesn't want something else being worshiped. We have to do our part. And our part is, in Romans 12, <coughs> 1 through 2, says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The Christian life is a matter of the heart, and it is pointed, should be pointed towards God. We are constantly concerned with obeying our loving Father in heaven and seeking to conduct his will on this earth at all times to his glory. Through Jesus and the Holy Spirit living in us, we begin to understand what it means to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Through discipline, responsibility, and consideration for the things of God, we learn to live a different way. It's not only, it's discipline, guys, but it's also a responsibility as a follower of Christ. If we are to be his witnesses out in the world, and God's saying, look, this is not holy. This is not what I want you to do. You're not representing in a good way. You just became, you could become a stumbling block for someone out in the world. Say someone sees you with a pack of cigarettes or sees you with your, I don't know, shopping addiction. You just became a stumbling block for someone. Not only did you, you didn't show good discipline, you're not considering God in this matter, but you just let down the big, that big responsibility for him of being his witness. Because we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 18 through 20, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, 
It would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teachings, they will obey yours also. So who sits on the throne of your heart? You don't have to tell me, you don't have to tell anyone, but this is between you and God. What part of the process are you in? And what part is, get, are you still in, are you in that conflict area? If it's, you're just checking Jesus out and you're seeing what this whole Jesus thing's about, I'm telling you, you will not regret it. If it's, you've accepted Christ and that's where you've kind of planted and took root in your conflict, you got all this conflict going on, you need to get out of the way and put God in front and let him change you from the inside out. And I promise you, he will do a mighty work in you. And he will use you beyond whatever your thoughts or imagines could ever be. I am living proof of that, guys. A lot of us are. If people would have saw me 12 years ago, or however many years it is, I'm making myself seem old. He'd have been like, there's no way that kid's ever going to be a minister. No way. God can do a mighty work if we allow him. God does so much for us. He wants to spend eternity with you. Salvation is just the start. There's a process that we have to keep building and working on We can't just sit around and act like it's going to come without not putting in some discipline. We need to trust God, put him on the throne of our heart, and let him change us from the inside out. Now to wrap things up, in Romans 6, chapter 1 through 7, (coughs) it says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We We are those who have died to sin, How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through the baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like his we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old selves was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Guys, we've been born again given a new life. We are a new creation in Christ and given this amazing new chance to become more and more like Christ, to build and grow in our relationship with God. Let him sit on your throne. I can't plead it enough. I promise you will not regret it. I think the hardest part of any person's walk is just getting out of the way. Because how many of us have been taught our entire life, that if we don't do it, if we don't make it happen, it ain't going to happen. And here comes Jesus. He said, take yourself off that throne and let me up there. Let me change you. So who sits on the throne of your heart? We're going to open up the altars. Maybe you have an addiction. Maybe some sin has a grip on you. Come before God and just give it to him. Leave it there. You're all stubborn enough to leave it. Maybe, Maybe you're just sitting at that salvation part and you're ready for the next step. Maybe you're just seeing who Jesus is. Maybe you need a closer walk with him. Maybe you need that fire reignited. He's waiting. He's always been there just saying, hey, just let me in. Go ahead, Rick.